button and we'll see a um, little red flashing dot in the upper left hand zoom window and that means we are recording and so i will turn over the floor to team 12 to share with us their design uh good afternoon everyone first of all thanks for coming and welcome to our presentation of the pcar the pressure controlled autonomous reactor uh, our team members who are all here consist of Austin, Riley, Ryan, Paul, Cassidy, Michel, myself, Mikey, and Chase. As the name implies, the PCAR was designed from the ground up to provide the user with the widest possible range of environmental conditions. Uh, the vision ultimately led you to the design that you see here, um, which is a single environmentally controlled chamber that houses everything to properly grow and monitor your biological experiments. Next slide, please. Um, using an extremely capable reversible heat pump and an off-the-shelf vacuum pump assembly attached to the main structure, uh, we aimed to simulate Martian or more extreme environments compared to other options on the market. Um, and this gives the customer more options to work with for their experiments without sacrificing any user safety or accuracy of the final results. Next slide. Uh, starting with the structure, the structure is a subsystem responsible for not only bringing the entire assembly together, but is also responsible for providing the ability to thermally insulate and hold a vacuum seal. Uh, to provide these capabilities, eight gauge galvanized steel sheet metal was chosen for the inner and outer walls, of the polyurethane foam inside. A strong sheet metal is required to be able to handle a low press pressure situation and withstand many parts being mounted to it. Using an ASPE chart, steel was chosen over aluminum because of its accessibility and price and galvanized steel was chosen for its corrosion resistance. Spray polyurethane, excuse me, spray polyurethane foam was chosen as it is a great insulating material, very cheap and easy to apply, and it's widely available. The foam is closed cell and has a temperature range of negative 20 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit when secured. The door is attached using heavy duty friction hinges to make sure that there is no unwanted door swinging to prevent injury or other mishaps. These hinges have an adjustable friction of 70 inch pounds of torque or below. The door is kept vacuum sealed with a double rubber gasket and thermally sealed with a silica fiber rope. The rope seal is square in shape to provide better fit and can withstand temperatures of negative 40 to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. The rubber gasket seal is grounded 55A medium hardness to allow for slight deformation to create a good seal with the door. For clarity, that is somewhere between a pencil eraser and a tire tread in terms of elasticity. The thermal seal is placed on the inside to prevent any unnecessary heating to the rubber seal, and it is also chemically resistant. Although the rubber seal is protected from the extreme heating by the silica fiber rope, it is also heat resistant to temperatures of negative 100 to 480 degrees Fahrenheit. There are adjustable rubber feet on the bottom to dampen any vibrations and allow for leveling should the feet car be placed on an unlevel surface. The feet also provide friction and prevent any unwanted sliding along a lap countertop. The door has a very large and accessible steel handle with a rubber grip mounted to the front. The door is kept closed via an electromagnet with a maximum pull of 80 pounds. This strong pull is to help the structure have a strong seal as well as prevent accidental opening of the door during an experiment. This electromagnet is mounted to the outside of the structure as it cannot handle extreme temperatures of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And galvanized steel is magnetic and extra pieces of the sheet metal will be used to make the mount for the magnet on the outside of the structure. Various types of hermetic seals are used to allow components to enter the walls of the structure while remaining airtight and thermally insulated. Bulkhead seals are used for any piping, such as the gas regulation pipes and the heating and cooling pipes. And finally, electrical wires are kept airtight using a rubber wire ground. Now on to the analysis. So as mentioned before, we decided to go with eight gauge steel walls. Um, this was chosen due to the fact that we don't have reinforcements from that inner wall to the outside wall. So we needed to choose a steel that was, uh, we needed to choose a thickness that was able to withstand that pressure. And so from the ASME appendix website, I found an equation based off of um, a non-reinforced pressure chamber that is rectangular as shown in this governing equation. The first half of that equation shows the amount of force that comes from, or the amount of stress applied based off of just the membrane itself of the wall. And the second half deals more with the actual bending moment that comes when you're from the pressure away from the neutral axis. Um, 
And so via the Ashby chart, we determined that the about maximum of steel, the maximum stress of steel before it fails is about 700. And so we used that with the equation to get the like minimum thickness that we possibly could. And so once we more so determined um, like the exact steel that we're gonna use, which is about A653 steel, I believe, um, has a yield strength of about 550 megapascals. Um, we then use that in tandem to essentially determine that, um, sorry, we use that to get the thickness. And then when we cross check that with other gauges of steel, we determined that we wanted to go with an eight um, gauge steel so that we had an actual um, like factor of safety rather than it being a factor of safety of one. And so with eight gauge steel, a thickness of 0 0.165 inches, we, we, got, we get a factor of safety of 1.3. Next slide. Hey, I'm Chase Montgomery, and I was the lead designer of the temperature control for our prototype. One of the key uh, needs and capabilities of this microbioreactor was the ability to heat and cool cell cultures for a variety of different experiment conditions. So in order to meet that requirement and control the temperature, uh, the design utilizes a reversible heat pump system, which can be seen to the right. This involves a thermodynamic process with a compressor, condenser, expansion valve, evaporator, and a reversing valve. So the cycle can act either as a heat pump and introduce heat into the chamber or be reversed with that four-way reversing valve to act as a refrigeration cycle and cool the chamber, which achieves both the heating and cooling requirements within uh, the same system, which is a plus. The cycle uses a R134A as the working fluid, and it pipes that into the heat exchanger directly inside the chamber to reject uh, or absorb the heat, while the rest of the cycle components are housed in the side compartment um, outside of the structure, which avoids us condi uh, conditioning extra air, uh, keeps that volume at a minimum in the chamber. So uh, also by placing the heat exchanger inside the chamber, it avoids the need to exchange ambient air and potentially release experiment effluent to the surroundings. So the only thing exchanging heat out of the control volume is that refrigerant. Additionally, the heat exchanger um, uses heat piping to heat or cool a conduction plate to allow conduction heat transfer mode to the well plate as well. What this does is act as a jump start to the transient heat response, as well as provide a uniform heating for the well plate. Uh, and additionally, to track and control our temperature subsystem, we have two temperature sensors. Uh, one is monitoring the evaporator outlet inside the, uh, the chamber on the heat exchanger, while the other one is attached to the liquid handling mount uh, towards the ceiling of the chamber to monitor the air temperature inside the chamber. Both sensors are then going to output a digital signal to our control microcontroller board housed in the UI control box on the roof of the structure. Uh, so then it can communicate the reversible heat pump to the temperature inside along with, along with cross compare with the user inputs and it'll output the necessary command. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide, we can look at some analysis of the subsystem. So when we were analyzing, uh, analyzing the design, one important requirement was to reach any set point temperature within 15 minutes to avoid any cell behavior at different temperatures uh, that would affect the data of the user. So one important distinction is that the requirement specifies the time for the cultures to reach the de desired temperature and not the air within the chamber due to the heat exchanger. So the design has heat put in the form of convection um, as the heat exchanger fan blows directly over the well plate, as well as conduction from uh, heat piping to the well plate. Some key assumptions we made were that initially the wells are at room temperature and the well plate was modeled as being full of water to approximate those thermal properties of the cell cultures even though they will have other like constituents inside the, uh, the mixture. Additionally, the air properties were idealized as constant, although they will vary slightly due to the input of gases inside the system. So from there, we could approximate the convection heat transfer um, by modeling, uh, modeling the uh, convective heat transfer coefficient as a steady state fan flow over a flat plate, which we could then use the corresponding Reynolds and Neusselt numbers to find our heat transfer coefficient we then use that and the Newton law of cooling to approximate the heat rate as a function of the temperature of the evaporator outlet. Additionally, we have that other mode of heat transfer of the conduction plate, which we model using a thermal resistance circuit between the well plate, tray, and the cultures. And uh, we treated this temperature distribution as linear with negligible contact resistance. 
So then with those heat rates known, we could solve the differential equation that you can see is the governing equation of the subsystem. And then when we apply the temperature bounds to the temperature extrema defined by the customer, which were 70 degrees C and four degrees C, uh, we reached an uh, answer of about 11.3 minutes to reach the maximum temperature of 70 degrees Celsius. And then to reach our lowest temperature that their customer requires at four degrees Celsius uh, takes us about 8.7 minutes. So notice both these are well below that 15 minute mark. So we have a comfortable margin um, due to those dual modes of heat transfer going on at the same time. So now we'll move on to the culture agitator uh, with Cassidy. All right, I, this is the culture shaker. And this subsystem agitates the cultures in three patterns, linear, orbital, and double orbital. It is also in charge of transportation in the X and Y directions. This subsystem moves the well plates and test tubes to all the other subsystems, including liquid handling, heating and cooling, ODFI measurements, and waste management. So because this system moves the other subsystems, those subsystems are simplified. So for example, this system moves to the well plates in the X and Y direction to the liquid handling system. And then the liquid handling system only has to move in the Z direction. Once liquid handling does its job, the culture agitator will move the well plate slightly over and the whole process will start again. This setup moves the platform, the setup that moves the platform in it's carrying a well plate, test tubes, liquid handling tips and fluid containers. The accuracy of the system is 0 0.089 millimeters per three, uh, 300 millimeters, which is much less than the radius of the smallest well plate in the 384 well plate. The platform is made of polycarbonate um, because the melting temperature is 155 degrees Celsius, which is much higher than the required temperature. It's also very resistant to chemicals and has a pore size of 0.2 micrometers. So if there was a spill, the platform would be safe. Another reason for choosing polycarbonate was because the ODFI measurement measurements will be taken through the plate. The platform has a high transparency of 90% and it is impact resistant, UV resistant and scratch resistant. Next slide, please. Thank you. The platform movement is controlled by two NEMA 14 stepper motors and precision lead screws. It's controlled with a closed loop system, which helps reduce the current that is actually used. To determine the amplitude and frequency of our system, we looked at the other culture agitators on the market and there was a large range, but the most common frequency was 180 to 280 RPM with some desiring 500 RPM to obtain a higher density. The NEMA 14 motors we used have a maximum speed of 3000 RPM. The lead screws have four leads and a travel distance of five millimeters per rotation. So the max velocity is 15,000 millimeters per minute, but this doesn't include load or constant changing of directions. So that speed is impossible for us to reach. So the frequency of 500 and an amplitude of five millimeters, the required velocity is 5,000 millimeters per minute, which is much lower than what the motor specs say. The nice thing about this system is that the frequency and amplitude are adjustable. So if a lower wavelength is desired, which it normally is, the amplitude can be increased. Once a prototype is built, testing can be done on the motors to see the actual maximum wavelength and frequency. Um, all right, so the NEMA motors have to move the load on the platform. To determine this load, it could be moved with the motors. The torque was found using this equation. It takes into account friction, pitch diameter, thread density, and the force. Using the specs from the motors and the lead screws, the torque required to lift the weight of the platform is 2.03 ounce inch. Now the torque is actually the torque to lift the weight vertically. So the torque to move the platform horizontally will be less. This was also taken with absolute worst conditions. So full well plates, a full 96 deep well plate, um, full liquid and liquid containers. Um, the continuous operation torque at max speed is 2.8 ounce inch. So it's capable of running the platform for sure. Um, to prevent unnecessary torque and current, the system will operate in closed loop control. Because of the feedback, the current will be only the current that is necessary to move our system. Um, lastly, I just wanted to run through the customer needs 
Um, it can be run in all three desired patterns. It fits both test tubes and well plates, which can even accommodate a 96 deep well plate, thanks to our ODFI. And all the materials are non-porous, and something extra nice about this system is the frequency and amplitude are adjustable. Now I'll let Ryan tell you about the liquid handling system. Hi. For liquid handling, we chose to go with an off-the-shelf tricontinent air duty premier. It has 200 microliter tips with aspiration and sense rates of one to 3,000 microliters per second. It can measure liquid levels with less than 1% error. One of its greatest assets is the ability to pip, both pick up and drop disposable pipette tips into the same location. For liquid storage, we, we're going to manufacture a holder out of polypropylene stock. It has four holding well, liquid holding wells. Each, the volume of each well is 23 milliliters and it can be filled to nearly 18 milliliters before spillage occurs. However, it should remain well below this 18 milliliters as the analysis uses many generalizations. The three, three of the wells are reserves for media for the customer to choose what they, they're using for the experiment. The fourth is for bleach that'll be used to neutralize the test tubes, and that'll be discussed further in the waste management section. On the liquid holder, there's 39 tips that can be used to prevent cross-contamination between the wells. For movement, we use rack and pinion, a rack and pinion system. They're driven by 750 RPM NEMA 17 motors, and they have 135 millimeters of travel. They should be greased prior to use to ensure proper function and prevent propagation of slop. Motor mounting points are designed as slots rather than holes so that the customer can fine tune the adjustment to make sure they have proper mesh of the gears and further enhance the, the lifespan of them. Even with these measures though, the design aims for the pinion gear to be the first to wear out as that's the cheapest part. Uh, for this reason, a $20 brass gear was selected to minimize the heat. The brass gear reduces upkeep costs and poses little risk of galvanic galvanic corrosion when used in conjunction with the 304 stainless steel rack. The, the system mounts to the structure, or will be welded to the structure, and the mount is made of galvanized stainless steel. Uh, the liquid handling and waste management NEMA 17 motors are mounted directly to it, as well as the rail carriages that guide the racks for the gears. As far as how they synergize with the other uh, subsystems, uh, one of the biggest, as Cassie talked about, is how the, the culture agitator can move to the liquid handling subsystem, um, and then it can move down and, and dispense fluid. And then as far as um, meeting the team's goal of being able to simulate many different environments, uh, clearance was kept to a minimum over the highest point on the culture agitator, which is the test tubes, and there's three millimeters of clearance, so we could keep the structure size to a minimum. Finally, this off-the-shelf option eliminates the need for testing and redesign that would be required with creating this liquid handling uh, part ourselves. Next slide. The time taken to fill a 384 well plate is approximately 4.8 minutes. Um, this assumes a working volume of 25 microliters as well as the use of a single tip. It also is calculated with a flow rate, the minimum flow rate requested by the customer of 225 microliters per second. This accounts for rack and pinion motion, aspiration, dispensing, movement of the culture shaker, trips to and from the liquid holder, and a 0 0.25 second buffer to account for slowing the rack and pinion down when it's coming to a stop. The torque on the pinion is determined so the loader motor speed can be calculated. The normal force on loading the pinion gear is, consists of the, the total weight of liquid handling and the acceleration during the weight of excel, the force of acceleration during movement. And then finally, R is the radius of the pinion gear. The load and motor speed was then used to determine the maximum linear speed of the rack and pinion, which came out to be 0 0.55 meters per second. However, the system would likely run at a much lower rate, around 0 0.3 meters per second was used for the 384 well plate calculation uh, to help make sure the gears last longer. The Lewis factor equation showed that the allowable torque on the pinion was 82.6 ounce inches, which is approximately 38% higher than the possible 51 ounce inches of torque that could be applied by the motor. 
Finally, spillage of the liquid holder was calculated using gravity, height of the well, radius of the well, and angular speed of the culture shaker. This assumes a constant circular shaking pattern. Therefore, for actual use, a lesser volume than 18 milliliters should be used. Next slide. And so for waste management, we again went with an off the shelf part from an Integra called the VacuSafe. It consists of a hand pipette tool, a polypropylene waste container, a holder for that container, and a filtered vacuum that prevents aerosols and allows for aspiration rates up to 17 milliliters per second. Stock, the product functions by pressing a button on the hand pipette that allows aspiration. In order to make the product work, a mount was designed that will always hold the button down and the VacuSafe pump will be connected to the Raspberry Pi within the UI that will communicate when to turn the pump on and off. The mount will be 3D printed from PETG as its softening temp is 85 degrees Celsius, which is well above the system's operational temperature. A 40 millimeter long stainless steel pipette tip is used on the VacuSafe, vacu, VacuSafe hand tool. This is, isn't long enough to reach the bottom of the test tubes. So to neutralize those, the fourth container, which is filled with bleach, will be collected by the Air-Z and dispensed into the test tubes. The solution should be a 10% bleach uh, solution as it remains usable for up to 30 days. For neutralization, one millimeter of bleach solution should be used per 10 millimeters of volume to ensure that all contaminants are eliminated. Longer tips are available for the VacuSafe, but this would compromise the team's intent to allow for a variety of testing environments as it would require expansion of the structure. The four, the four liter polypropylene waste container that comes with the VacuSafe can easily be disconnected via quick connects and then safely transported to an autoclave. After the experiment, the entire hand pipette can also be placed into the autoclave. Finally, for passing the tubing from the waste management through the structure, uh, a 120 PSI, PSI 85 degrees Celsius rated PTFE bulkhead was used to connect the tubing. The system is written via a rack companion system that uses all of the same components and has nearly the same exact performance specs as liquid handling due to similar weight. It's also mounted to the same stainless steel mount that uh, is attached to the structure. As the, the same as liquid handling. Yeah. So the time taken to aspirate a 384 well plate came out to be four and a half minutes. This again assumed a working volume of 25 microliters. And it accounts for rack and pinion motion, aspiration, movement of the culture shaker, and again that 0 0.25 second buffer that uh, accounts for the slowing of the um, rack and pinion per well. This is a highly conservative value as it was calculated using an aspiration rate of 50 microliters per second for the vacuum safe. Again, the force on the pinion gear accounts for both static weight and acceleration forces. The torque was calculated so that the loaded, mo loaded motor speed could be attained. And then the loaded motor, speed, loaded motor speed was obtained using the equation shown as LMS. Um, and then using that, we got the maximum linear speed, which again was 0 0.55 meters per second due to very close weights with the liquid handling subsystem. Um, However, once again, it would run at a slower speed. Um, and then finally, the Lewis factor equation also gave a maximum allowable torque of 82.6 ounce inches, which is again, 38% higher than what is possible by the 51 ounce inch torque of the motor. Um, so the ODFI system uh, consists of two rotating arms um, and they are made out of 3D printed ABS filament. And the distance between both arms um, is controllable and uh, the rotation feature allows it to measure both test tubes and also well plates as needed. Um, so the rotation is achieved by a NEMA 14 mortar and um, the distance is controlled um, using a NEMA 17. Um, and so the reason why we chose ABS as the material is because uh, we have customized these arms uh, to reduce deflection that can be caused due to the weight of the sensors. And um, so 3D printing this material allows us to uh, control the design or customize the design as we want it. 
uh, and the cost uh, was not as high as um, it would have been doing it out of an aluminum uh, material. And so the time taken for a measuring a 384 well plate is below the upper limit of 6.5 minutes. This includes uh, the time taken by the, the well plate to move um, underneath the sensors and the time taken by the sensors themselves to measure uh, each well. And so this uh, total comes out to be uh, 6.07 minutes and it can be optimized depending on the, the pattern that you choose to uh, measure the movement of the well plates, which has to be in coordination with the orientation of the sensors, uh, but this can be optimized. Um, so the light source, we are using LEDs, high power LEDs and the wavelength to reduce cell death uh, or causing cell damage is, um, so the ideal wavelength would be 750 nanometers and the intensity has to be below the upper limit of one kilowatt per centimeter square. Um, and the, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the sensors we are using for uh, FI measurements are a spark fun sensor and for OD measurements, uh, we are using the specs that are described on the slide. And uh, these are, and as uh, Cassidy mentioned earlier that transmissivity of uh, polycarbonate shouldn't be an issue because um, that was taken into consideration and it is around 90%. So it will not cause a problem with uh, taking measurements of OD and FI system. And we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Hey, y'all. I'm Paul, and I'm talking about our environmental regulation subsystem. Um, this controls different parameters for the environment, um, excluding the temperature. Um, but the three main parts of the system are the vacuum pump, which is intended to generate a vacuum in the test chamber to make a negative pressure differential with the atmosphere. It also includes the machine light strips for photosynthesis and the gas regulation system, which uses solenoid valves to control the inflow and composition um, of the atmosphere inside the test chamber. We chose an electric vacuum pump for the system that can generate a vacuum of 99.2% of the atmosphere, which is much higher than, uh, it's much higher of a vacuum than we need for the experiments that we desire. Um, if the 99.2% vacuum was to be generated in the system, it would take about 1.3 minutes um, when you consider the flow rate of the pump and the volume of the system. And this is a slightly conservative estimate because it idealizes the vacuum pump and assumes that the pump flow rate would remain consistent throughout the whole process, which um, is an ideal assumption because the flow rate decreases as the vacuum would increase. Um, at the maximum temperature of our system is taken to be 70 degrees Celsius. The maximum vacuum that can be generated is about a 68% vacuum um, because we are worried about cell death from boiling of the media that the culture is um, inside of. And at the minimum temperature of zero degrees Celsius, the maximum vacuum that can be generated is about a 95% vacuum. These values were found by comparing the pulling point of the media at different pressures and then looking at the relative temperatures at those pressures. If we could go to the next slide, please. So like I mentioned, the 99.2% vacuum would be ideal for us to simulate extremely low pressure environments like those found on Mars um, for the cultures. But because the mediums, um, I think Chase mentioned, we're assuming the mediums are composed mostly of water we're using the corresponding boiling point at um, different pressures. Um, in order to um, increase, or I guess decrease the pressure further, we we're able to lower the temperature of the system, which then correspondingly um, changes the boiling point and allows us to have um, lower uh, pressures in our systems without um, killing the cell cultures or boiling the media that um, they're involved in. Um, so because of this, the maximum vacuum is limited at different experimental temperatures um, so that we can prevent cell death and experiment failure. The computer functioning for the system will 
um, calculate the and limit the vacuum that can be pulled in the chamber according to the experimenter inputs on the temperature that the sensor is at. Next slide, please. So we're using two 18 watt LED strips that are mounted onto the side of the system to provide light for photosynthesis in the system. These lights can be rotated manually to provide direct or indirect lighting on the cell cultures. For our gas regulation system, we have two explosive proof solenoids that are used to regulate the hydrogen and methane gases. And then we have three regular solenoids that are used to regulate the other three gases that can be introduced into the system. After each of these solenoids, we have a check valve or one-way valve that was implemented to prevent the backflow of gases and specifically prevent one of the explosive gases, excuse me, gases from reaching one of the non-explosive solenoid valves and possibly um, blowing up and causing an accident. A release valve is also connected to the system that can be connected to a steam hood to allow the atmosphere after an experiment to be vented um, into a steam hood and not into the um, lab environment in case the atmosphere is hazardous. Some indicator lights that um, we will talk about in the UI that can be used for the environmental regulation system include a light that indicates a hazardous atmosphere or non-earth atmosphere so that the experimenter doesn't try and open the chamber um, and then contaminate or ruin the atmosphere. We could also have an indicator showing that there's a pressure differential in the system or that a vacuum is currently generated or another light that may indicate that the vacuum pump is currently under use. Now we'll move on to Riley talking about the user interface. So the main components of the user interface sits in a box on top of the structure. You've probably seen it in some of the pictures from before. Um, the main components are the power supply, the output to the PCC component, to the Raspberry Pi, the indicator lights, and our microcontrollers. Um, so the power supply is a 600 watt power supply. It allows us to ensure that even if everything is turned on at once, we are due, we have enough power to run everything and we'll likely never brown out unless there's wire failure or something somewhere. Um, the whole system is run via an ethernet cable that connects the output to the PC um, applicator. And with the machine, we can have like a CD or something, the common way that they make, um, that they install drivers for machines nowadays um, that can allow you to download the interactable user interface to the computer that you're using. Um, and from there, you can essentially set up whatever system that you, whatever test that you want to set up. Um, on the power box as well, there is a power switch that connects directly between the power supply and the Raspberry Pi that allows us to shut it off entirely within seconds. Um, if you need the emergency shut off, the light also has an embedded light. I mean, the switch has an embedded light that allows us to know whether or not it's turned on. Um, the UI will also, or the interactable UI on the computer will also have an emergency shut off button, depending on which one is more accessible at the time. Um, speaking of accessibility, we have six indicator lights on the top that each map to different aspects that we're gonna be, um, different aspects that are occurring inside the machine. Since we, know, we don't have a way to view the inside of the machine, we use the indicator lights to essentially say the, um, we're currently running an ODFI test, or we're being pressurized, or non or depressurized, I should say. Um, the system is currently heating up. These indicator lights will essentially um, say what's going on inside the system, and they are placed on top of the box so that they are easily visible from anywhere you are in the room. Um, next, we shall move on to the design experiments. Uh, the, this slide gives a representation of our design expenses. As you can see, we are well under budget and plan on continually lowering our costs by finding more optimal materials for a more efficient design. On the left, we have our overall costs broken down into different categories, such as off-the-shelf parts, raw materials, and assembly costs. On the right, we broke down each subsystem's cost and, and the biggest expense contributing to that sub subsystem's cost. We did this to demonstrate that our money is being spent on important details and features, as well as to keep track of what our largest expenses are and how we might reduce them. Okay. 
Riley, I believe this is your slide. I'll, I'll go ahead. Our design is capable of extraterrestrial conditions. We want to have the ability to simulate Mars environmental conditions and have the ability to possibly simulate many other environments far from Earth. Our design is user-friendly and will be controlled via a common lab computer with an intuitive user interface. Our design is completely autonomous and hands off on the And I know where the bills are. Okay, if I think. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, did you have a question, Rick? I will continue. Um, our design is completely autonomous and hands off once the experiments have started. Our design is under budget. And lastly, our design is extremely safe and it was designed to have high factors of safety and be as foolproof as possible. Uh, thank you to everyone who came out to our presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to watch us and we appreciate any input and questions you may have. All right, great. And that was it. Thank you for your presentation. Sorry, um, we're getting a, a little bit of background noise from, from somebody. I jumped in and tried to mute everybody, but some people, there we go. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so let's uh, open the floor to questions from our, uh, our panel. Hey guys, uh, this is Tom Singer from Northrop. Uh, good, good job, good presentation. You had some uh, some features in there. I think the uh, the vacuum system was uh, the only uh, project that I've I've seen that uh, incorporated that so far. Um, that is a cool feature. Um, and despite incorporating that, I think you're also the lowest cost I've seen, which I suspect is in part because you integrated the uh, the shaking and the motion systems, which was a a really clever thing to do um, you know if, if you're already moving in the plane then then take advantage of that uh, that said um, shaking is is something that tends to induce wear and I'm wondering if uh, if you've considered any impact to the accuracy of your XY location um, you know over the life of of your system um, yes so I designed everything is um, stainless steel that will have wear and I designed everything for um, infinite cycles. So um, by finding the endurance, the corrected endurance limit, um, I could find the um, minimum, I mean, the maximum stress that we could use and I kept it below that stress. Okay, uh, I mean, that's, uh... Fatigue and, and sort of you know overall strength of, of the system is, is one thing and, and I, I certainly appreciate that and I noticed that you had a, uh, a vibration analysis uh, in there and, and natural frequencies of uh, of your of your components I, I definitely appreciated that as well um, I'm I'm just more concerned you know over time as, as things slide over top of each other um, th that potentially induces some wear that might affect. Uh, positioning that could come into play for a, uh, you know, a, a 384 well plate. Um, so that that's something you know, it, you know, probably worth thinking about, and and whether that's going to uh, pose any difficulties long term for this. Um, also, uh, I noticed that uh, a lot of components, including your case and a couple of the uh, components internal, are galvanized steel. Why would you go with that material? We decided on galvanized steel because it has a low corrosion. Um, sorry, it's Does corrosion it? resistant. So is it? Uh, based on you're, you're going to have found. you're going to have 70 degrees Celsius uh, humid environment, um, and uh, you know cleaning solutions being wiped on this thing. It's it's you know the exterior is on a bench in a lab with grad students who. I don't know. Yeah, I, I I can certainly see the uh, the surface coating getting dinged up. Um, I, I would imagine manufacturing, depending on on your manufacturing, um, if if you're planning on fabricating and then uh, hot dipping uh, the uh, the steel, uh, then then that's one thing. If if you're starting with galvanized plate and bending it up and and cutting, you're going to expose surfaces and and crack coatings. Um, it's it's a choice that that presents some concern to me. I, you know, 
some of that could be mitigated. Uh, but it, you know, just sort of from the, you know, from my view, I'd, I'd want to think that through a little bit. Okay. Um, I don't believe we did consider that sadly. Um, aside from it just being corrosion resistance, but yeah, we forgot to account for, um, the like natural wear and tear of people touching it and stuff like that. Yeah, that's definitely something we can consider before our final report and the final design. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, you know, I, I honestly, you know, from a, from a lab environment, most of the, most of the stuff that you wind up seeing in labs tends to be stainless or aluminum or, or something like that. Um, galvanized just sort of stands out to me as, as, you know, maybe unusual from, from that perspective. Um, let's see, uh, your, uh, what was it? Your, your waste system, you've got a, a four liter container for waste. How much fluid do you anticipate really handling in, in this? That, that is just the container that comes with the system. Yeah. The, the system is like one whole purchase. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll let some other people jump in for a little bit. So normally I'm supposed to be just the master of ceremonies and not ask any questions, but um, you guys uh, put up a, a thermo chart. So uh, I've got to ask a, a thermo question. Yes, so, we got to talk, Dr. Trum. We have to talk? Yeah, I, you just, I know you'll enjoy it. Oh, uh, okay. Well, you you might not enjoy my question, but um, well, yeah, I might not. I'm just saying you like to talk. I, so, um, so I I think I heard correctly. Uh, th there it is, right there. The environmental uh, th that curve, which was boiling point. There we go. Ah, thermo. Ah. Um, so this is this is vacuum versus boiling point, and um, I, I think I heard you say that you wanted to set the vacuum such that when the water started to boil, it wouldn't damage the cells. Um, and so that, if I, if I understood correctly, kind of set the, the lowest vacuum that you felt like you could get to. And I guess my question is, what, what is it about water boiling that damages the cells? Is it the temperature or the agitation? So I think there are multiple, multiple concerns that come with that. Um, as we lowered the temperature to be able to, to increase the vacuum that we can generate, we get into like the range of like around zero degrees Celsius, which then is dangerous for the, the cells, um, depending on what kind of cell cultures you're working with. Um, I think that most E. coli dies at around zero degrees Celsius. So we don't want to pursue temperatures lower than that. Um, also, if we do have the media boiling, um, the agitation, um, like you were mentioning, may be dangerous to the cells. Also, if the media disappears and there is no nutrients or media for the cells to remain in, um, which I think would also then lead to cell death. So you guys- like, That could also lead to a splashing problem. Yeah, I was also gonna jump in and say the same thing. You're introducing aerosols. If it's biohazardous material, that could also be dangerous for the user as well. Do you, do you guys, maybe I missed this. Do you have a-, a lid that prevents splashing when you're doing the shaking process? Um, no, we don't, but we did the calculations um, in a circular pattern and in a linear pattern. And with our low speed and low, um, low amplitude, it won't splash out. Um, that's with half full wells, um, but I, as I did research online, it looks like most people were not filling it up that full. So we should be safe. So let me ask, th th this might not be a fair question because I'm not, heat transfer is not a prerequisite for the class, but what, what boiling mode do you expect? Do you, do you expect with relatively smooth wall, well plates or, or falcon tubes, um, a nucleate type boiling that would cause aerosols to be created? I don't have an answer for that. I don't know if anyone else has something better to say. 
I know the exact curve you're talking about. I remember from heat transfer, but I don't remember well enough to know like at what point it starts nucleating. Yeah, I, I, I'm, my guess at least, and, and it, we, you know, everything in heat transfer is always empirical. So um, we'd, we'd probably actually have to get a well plate and, and pull vacuum on it and see what happens. But, but my guess is that you're not going to get nuclear boiling because you've got a relatively smooth surface, at least not, not right at, you know, kind of this 70 degrees Celsius temperature threshold. I think um, you guys are, are right in saying that the, the water is going to start to evaporate certainly more, more quickly, but you're not going to get that vigorous boil that you're used to when you make pasta or something like that, right at, right at 70 Celsius. Um, so anyway, I just, I, I, I'm probably harping on this more than I should, but um, the, the, the comment that sort of set me off was um, wanting to avoid 70 Celsius boiling because it would harm the cells. And I thought, uh Oh, just want to make sure that they got that, that regardless of whether the water's boiling or not, it's, I, I think I'm right in saying it's the temperature that kills the cells, not the agitation. Uh, and so I think I think you would be all of the things being equal safe to have I'll, I'll say boiling water in air quotes boiling water at low pressure at 70 degrees Celsius and I think the cells would be very happy they might actually be happier in that environment because they're getting mixed up. Oh man, Dr. Trump just came up with an alternate agitation system. I actually have a uh, a comment on this. Um, what? comprises 90% of a cell's volume? Yeah, so the, the water inside of the cells. I'm sorry, I, you just broke up on my end. What did you, what was your answer? Water inside of the cells? Yeah, water inside of them. Um, so what's gonna happen to the water inside of the cells if you're at a low enough pressure that you're boiling at 70 degrees Celsius? They would boil as well. You think so? I don't think they would so. go pop. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, they would likely expand. Yeah. Now, now that we're was definitely... our main intent whenever putting this on there was that we knew that uh, you know if the, if the people conducting the lab didn't think of it, we wanted our system to have some sort of function in it where no state of matter or you know they weren't introducing any. A variable that they didn't already know about, such as boiling or anything like that, to make sure that their experiment went as planned and as intended. Yeah, this is well. Anyway, so I'll I'll stop there because it's we're we're now very far maybe into the into the bio side of things. My guess is that cells would have internal mechanisms that would dampen out the boiling. Right, you could have a a cell at you're shaking well, they're your head, salty, no? right? So they'll they'll probably boil a little bit lower temperature than uh, than you would expect with given pressure. Cells uh, cells are cells are like little balloons, and if they get they and they're very easy to rupture, except for plant cells that have a more rigid cell wall. But yeah, cells are little 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 tiny things that like to go pop when they get pressure when they get gas bubbles that are too large inside of them. I think this is a great experiment to try if the design is chosen, just saying. Yeah, I, my, my entire PhD, I, there's that, that comment about a, a watched pot never boils. That's what I did for six years. I watched water that never actually boiled. <laughs> so anyway, sorry, we, we can, we can move away from thermal. It's just this, I don't get to talk to talk about thermal very much in, in my current line of work. So I was excited to have a conversation about it. So anyway. <laughs> okay, move on yeah, to something that was else. our whole point in, in making it pressurized was that you know there's a lot of things that we, we don't know that way this experiment could be done and these type of questions could be asked okay are, are there are there other other questions i have one i have one go ahead um I'm wondering what type of maintenance you might be expecting on your reversible cooling heating system in the foreseeable future to keep it running at uh, peak performance. Um, so there is some 
uh, foreseeable maintenance because uh, turns out somewhat recently our 134A is uh, being like uh, changed the regulations. So especially for like a, a university setting, they'll probably not want to be using our 134A. So we may need to change out that compressor in order to meet that requirement. Um, besides that, the compressor is rated for, um, I forget how many hours. I think it, when we did the Calixil last um, over five years, even though I know the, the requirement is 10 years, um, that's the one point that like we expect there to be some maintenance required. Can I ask the uh, the compressor lifetime that you're talking about? Is that expecting like what, what kind of duty cycle is that expecting? Because I'm you know I'm sort of picturing if you're trying to maintain a a temperature, this may be cycling on and off uh, more frequently than uh, than is expected when you're talking about a five year lifetime. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying because the um, we'd only need to be running it cycl cyclically and like to just maintain that furl temperature, not run it full schedule the whole time. So in that case, like um, I can recheck my numbers. Uh, it might be over five years then. Well, I'm thinking it might be under if it's kind okay. of on and off repeatedly, because startup and is you know uh, okay. generally the worst the worst for machines. Switching between heating and cooling, potentially too. Mm, yeah. Our structure is also uh, very thick, almost overkill. So we're thinking that it's going to be very very thermally insulated. Uh, nearly as much as a fridge. So we're hoping that we can really limit how often it has to come on or off. And also we could reduce how many times it is cycling on or off using like a bank band controller with a, a large um, bed band, depending on how specific the users would need the temperature to be. Can I ask, uh, back to the, uh, the shaking system, uh, you, you're shaking Sort of as a consequence of of you know combining the shaking with X Y movement, um, you're you're shaking everything, including like pipette tips, which uh, are they are those held like fairly tightly in the container, including I mean the loose ones just look like they'd be sitting in the bigger holes, right? No, they'll they'll all be contained in the the smaller holes that you can see on there, so they shouldn't come out during the shake. What are the what are the larger holes for? Uh, the larger holes are for the liquid uh, that the liquid handling uses. Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah, okay. I, I was I was kind of gonna get it at how noisy this was gonna be um, if, if you had a bunch of things rattling around. And that, that's maybe a question that that is, you know, certainly relevant to some of the other teams that seem like they've got more mass going back and forth than you guys do. Um, but just you know, kind of, I'm I'm curious if if you've given any thought to how loud this would be when it's operating in the in a lab. I can speak on that a bit. Um, again, our structure is relatively thick and it's uh, we put rubber feet on it to dampen any sort of vibrations or anything like that. So we're hoping that the, the loudest part would by far be the compressor or the vacuum on the outside, which would be running intermittently, but that the machines and things going on on the inside would be almost inaudible. Yeah, I'm guessing the worst part would be the vacuum on the outside because it's not insulated by anything, but according to the manufacturer, it's less than 50 decibels at one meter away. So that is my guess. That would be the worst that it would get. Does your customer have a that requirement? That running at the Does your customer have a requirement for noise? Um, no, no requirement was spec uh, calling out any decibel noise or anything. Ooh, ooh that's not the same. The customer may not have specified a requirement. But that doesn't mean they, they don't actually have a requirement. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, I think the safe amount for a human to uh, listen to every day, I think it's via OSHA requirements is maybe 70 decibels, but don't quote me on that value. So if, as Mikey said, the compressor is below that value, then I wouldn't be too concerned about it because that's that's where I can see the concern coming from is if it's uh, damaging the ear canals of the lab technicians. Yep. Also, if it's operating inside a fume hood, then that would be an extra protection from like outside sound getting outside of the fume hood. 
Yep. And it does have a bit of protection from this outside box, and we could apply some sort of uh, foam or sound dampening material to the outside of that, just to prevent as much sound from getting out of this container as possible. All right. And if we, if we got time, I got one more question, Dr. Trump. We have 45 seconds. Okay, the uh, the LEDs for photosynthesis that, that you've got inside, is there any uh, thought given to uh, sort of uniform intensity of light on the uh, cell cultures? Like, do you have anything that's going to shadow? There is not much thought given to that, um, especially because uh, the, as you can see in this picture here, with the um, shaker being off towards more the right side of the system, um, and us having the light source on both the left and the right side, um, we were hoping that the intensity would be kind of equal depending upon whether the cell culture, or the well plates were above the heating system or at the liquid and handling system, or whether the lights were providing the direct or indirect light, depending on how they were oriented. Okay. Yeah, it would also be moving almost constantly, taking measurements or doing other processes. Um, so we're assuming, you know, we could shake it on the right side. And if uh, that was a problem, we could also move it over here and shake it over here because we have the capability to shake it uh, anywhere within that range. Okay, uh, so on that note, let's let's wrap it up because we're at four. Oh, we're actually over time by a minute. Um, so I'm going to stop recording.